And for more, Asia Times correspondent and journalist Pepe Escobar is talking to us all the way from Brazil. Pepe, always good to see you. So you hey, have an sir. article out um, entitled, Why the U.S. Fears Arab Democracy. So why does the U.S. fear Arab democracy? Have you been able to answer that question? Yes, because it's all related to Israel and oil. So you need dictators, you need autocrats, you need monarchies that will not attack Israel, that will always ensure the flow of oil to the U.S. and Western markets is on, and they are not going to contest U.S. foreign policy. So uh, Sadat fit the bill, uh, the Camp David 1979 Accords, Mubarak fit the bill for 30 years, and Suleiman, which Mubarak too, as the street protesters rightly say, also fits the bill. Thus. He's the perfect interlocutor for the U.S. And obviously the U.S. don't know who to talk to in the opposition. They started a dialogue with El Baradei last week, and now it's mute. Nobody talks about Baradei for three or four days in the U.S. press because they're not talking anymore. You also refer to Omar Suleiman as the Sheikh Al Torture. Why is that? Not me. <laughs> Not me. It was the in your article. It was in your article. Yes, of course. It's the title of my story because this is what I've been getting from Egyptian bloggers and people in the square. They call Suleiman Sheikh Al Torture because until, uh, the context is important. Until 2007, nobody in Egypt knew who was the head of the Mukabarat, the military intelligence. This was. The Egyptian public for the past three, three and a half years now became acquainted with Suleiman. And now they all know that he was the CIA point man for the extraordinary renditions in Egypt. And he was the man who extracted the confession from Al Libi that ended up in Colin Powell's speech in February 2003 proving there was a link between Saddam and Al-Qaeda. This is absolutely crucial. This information was extracted under torture. And who was the CIA man, point man, who supervised the torture? Omar Suleiman. Thus, Sheikh al-Torture. Now, you also wrote that this quote-unquote orderly transition is not real change that we can believe in as far as the Egyptian people think. So what is real change then that they can believe in if not Suleiman? Well, the, the real change is that enormous list of demands that's being um, circulated among the protesters, among uh, youth groups, uh, the Kefaya group, the April 6 groups, uh, socialists, Nasserists, uh, the Wafdi party, and everybody who's more or less part of the opposition. This implies, first of all, Mubarak stepping down. Uh, a committee that is going to uh, study the Constitution and uh, alter the Constitution, then submit this altering to a referendum. Um, judges who will supervise the whole uh, process. Uh, the end of the state of emergency. Suleiman, on the record, if I'm not mistaken, two days ago said no. We will change it when the security situation improves. This could be in 2050. So uh, if you listen to these demands, which are the demands of uh, Egyptian civil society, that's the roadmap for change. In fact, the roadmap now is being uh, organized by the military regime as well. Now, there's a military dictatorship in Egypt at the moment. There are four generals, including Suleiman and Tantawi, the Minister of Defense. They are organizing the whole process. So there is no dialogue. In fact, there is no dialogue. This dialogue that started this Monday is a fiction. Well, speaking of uh, Egyptian civil society, you made an un another interesting point that I wanted to bring up, and that is that the Muslim bro if the Muslim Brotherhood uh, would, would run tomorrow, you say that they might get 30% of the vote, but that they're not that's... the face of Egypt. So if that's the case, then why do you think that there's so much fear, especially from the media, uh, about the Muslim Brotherhood? Well, because... Uh... The official narrative concerning the Muslim Brotherhood that it's being developed uh, between Washington and Tel Aviv, basically, for these past at least 10 years, constant is Muslim Brotherhood equals Al-Qaeda equals terrorism. It's not true. The Muslim Brotherhood, they renounced violence 30 years ago in the late 70s. They, uh, they ran as independents, and they had many seats in the previous parliament before this fake election in December 2010. Uh, they are very pragmatic. They are, in fact, afraid 
of advertising that they would like a, a, an Islamic caliphate or Sharia law. They don't want it. They are members of uh, participatory democracy. They want to have a saying government. I'm not sure they want to have ministers, as they said uh, yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. They don't want ministers in a new government. They just want to participate normally. And all estimates by Egyptians, the Muslim Brotherhood has between 15% and a maximum of 30% of the representation. So they will never, never be able to organize a, uh, a majority government. That's a very interesting uh, point. And, you know, it, the other thing here is that we've seen a lot of partisan politics play out here in Washington, D.C. Uh, but when it comes to this issue in particular, there doesn't seem to be much difference uh, between the Democrats and Republicans as far as who to support in this case in Egypt. Uh, you're right, because uh, the consensus in Washington, no matter Democrats or Republicans in power, since uh, Jimmy Carter, in fact, is... Our Middle East plan has two pillars, Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Saudi Arabia for the oil and, e and Egypt for as a kind of our huge cop on the beat after uh, the U.S. lost Iran with, uh, with the fall of the Shah. So if one of these pillars disappears, the whole U.S. foreign policy for the Middle East disappears as well. And this implies, once again, to what we were talking about in the beginning, Israel and oil. All bringing it back to, to those two points, huh? Asia Times correspondent Pepe Escobar. Always interesting analysis uh, from you, Pepe. Thanks. Thank you.